Welcome to session 10. In session 10, we're gonna look at a concept that J James is uh, unpacking for us that's rooted and established throughout the people of God, throughout all generations. In fact, from the Exodus moving forward, the people of God are commanded to live a specific way with their resources, with their power, and with their influence. Namely, they are to never oppress or be overbearing on those who have less power, less money, less access, than they do. It's the idea of, uh, of caring for and being generous to and using our power and our resources to strengthen, encourage, and build up rather than um, hold down, oppress, or neglect. And, and really, as, as strange as this sounds, I'm excited for this session because practical steps around this are, are not as ethereal as you think. Like the simple act uh, of budgeting and understanding where your money is going is a real first step in being the generous people that God has called us to be. And so let, let's hop into session 10. have your Bibles, James chapter five, we're gonna look at the first six verses. While you're turning there, while you're finding that specific page, uh, in the April issue of Texas Monthly, there was a, a featured piece about a suburb outside of Houston along the San Jacinto River um, called Highlands. So it wasn't called the Highlands, it was just called Highlands. And Highlands was a master planned community where uh, there were lot restrictions, so the lots were big. There weren't any, you know, it wasn't the let's go play in the backyard uh, type of lots, all right? It, it was big spaces, pasture land, magnificent home, um, just a uh, the, the American dream embodied, green pastures, large houses, beautiful master planned community. However, not all was well in Highlands despite its external beauty. See, in 1965, the Champion Paper Mill, which was located in Pasadena, Texas. Anybody ever been to Pasadena, Texas? You didn't stay long, did you? Yeah, and then you, you bowed out. I know, I went to high school close to that. Um, so in Pasadena, Texas, uh, worked out a contract with McGinnis Industrial Maintenance Corporation to dispose of Champion's industrial waste. MIMC dug pits along the San Jacinto River and dumped toxic waste there until 1967 when the unlined pits reached capacity. Because if you're gonna dispose of toxic waste, you might as well do it next to a river, right? I mean, we might as well just put that as close to our water supply as we can get it. The following year, MIMC's board of directors voted to abandon the site. Over the next four decades, the river bank that separated the pits from the river gradually eroded until large sections of the toxic waste pits were submerged beneath the San Jacinto River. The site was basically unknown to anyone else until 2005 when the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department realized what was there. By this time, the suburban sprawl had landed highlands two miles from these pits, and in 2008, Hurricane Ike struck just east of the pits and flooded the Highland area. The amount of sickness in Highland post-2008 was staggering. The amount of cancer and digestive disorders plus other disorders went through the roof. See, it's a terrifying idea that in the middle of such external beauty, there can be such toxicity. See, see, there's a bit of a juxtaposition taking place, and, and, and it took place in the Highlands. At this point, this has gone to trial, and uh, MIMC has paid out millions and millions and millions of dollars to the victims. But, but there's a juxtaposition of this picturesque, beautiful environment that's so laced with toxicity that in this beautiful picturesque what we all kind of want and desire we're dying in fact the very showers we take the waters we drink the air we breathe is killing us and so um, it, it's a terrifying illustration, but one meant to be, um, because what I wanna try to do today is to help us understand that we are very much a, in the midst of a toxicity just like that, a type of deadly, silent, soul-shriveling, life 
risk-taking, vitality-stealing environment that's well below what God would have for us and sticks us into a type of trapped boredom in which the true potential that we were created for is never realized for the toxicity. So James chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Come now, you rich. So let's stop there for a second, because some of you went, okay, not talking to me. (laughs) All right? Um, If you make $25,000 a year, you are in the wealthiest 2% of the world. Did you hear me? If you make $25,000 a year, you're in the wealthiest 2% of the world. So in in this context, you might be pulling in 17 and feeling broke, and I'm telling you that you're actually, by global standards, wealthy. You are someone's Bill Gates. You tracking with me? You're someone's Bill Gates. Someone would have their mind blown at how you live, even if you think you're living in um, humble means. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fatted your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, if you're a skeptic or unbeliever, let me just start like this. We're not taking an offering today, so you can breathe, all right? This isn't money, extended offering day, so if you've got that kind of, I knew they just wanted my money, I don't want your money, keep your money. I don't need a new plane, or my um, 05 Honda is running just fine, all right? I don't need new gear, anything like that, and so this isn't that type of sermon. This is a sermon for the good of your own soul, and so you can hear it through skeptical lenses, but I can assure you of this, I am not interested in your money, and my outline will prove it. So James is gonna argue, and he's gonna join Jesus in Matthew 6, arguing really four things. The first is that money is dangerous. It's not bad, it's dangerous. So money is dangerous. It's not a bad thing to have money. Think of money like fire. Like fire can keep you warm, it can cook food, it can also burn everything to the ground. So money is dangerous. And it's so dangerous because the heart is deceptive. And if you, in your deceptive heart, play around with the dangers of money and you end up loving money, it's deadly. So money is dangerous. The heart is deceptive. A love of money is deadly. And it's only the gospel that can deliver us from this. So that's the outline that we just read that will also be supported by the teachings of Christ on the Sermon on The mount. Now, uh, when I'm talking about toxicity, here's here's what I want you to to kind of start to look at and consider. Um, In 2014, Media Dynamics Incorporated revealed uh, in a study that a typical adult's daily consumption of media has grown from 5.2 hours in 1945 to 9.8 hours in 2014. So that our media consumption per day, that's your phone, your tablet, your um, computer, and your television. We spend close to 10 hours hours a day on those devices, and in some sense, you have to just to survive in the modern world, right? I mean, this is the world we live in. It's the world that God has um, put us here in, and so it's not surprising, but this is our reality. Now, in that 10 hours uh, a day that we're in uh, this media consumption, um, the study summarized that the number of ads an adult are now exposed to across the five media outlets, these are the five major media outlets, TV, radio, internet, newspaper, and magazine, is about 360 ads a day. Now, here's what's interesting. As our time in media uh, has 
increased. There was a massive spike about five years ago on the sheer number of ads. It was like 700 something ads a day, but we figured it out. We figured out Netflix. We figured out Hulu. We figured out ways around the ads. We got DVR so we could fast forward through the ads. So that cut our ad consumption in nearly half. And yet here's the reality, despite all of your ability to block pop-ups, and this is just the five major outlets. This isn't car wraps. This isn't billboards. This is just the five major media um, markets, 360 ads a day, which means 360 times a day you're being told, hey, you don't have this, or you should have this, you need this, Look at this. What you have is now old. This is now new. What you have is no longer cool. This is now cool. And so 360 times a day, you are being enticed. You are being called into discontentment. See, this environment sows into us the perpetual desire to get and to keep and to have. And it's a type of treadmill that can never satisfy us so that the lie we will give our lives to is that we need more of what we actually already have. This is slavery. It's toxic. It's a lie. So James, speaking in to this church, says money is dangerous. And because of money, misery is coming. He says, riches are rotted, garments are moth-eaten, and gold and silver have eroded. So what would make all of our wealth erode and unravel and be moth-eaten and worthless? Why is it so dangerous? Well, um, we start to see in verse 3b, you have laid up treasure in the last day. So here, here's what James's accusation is. The reason why money is so dangerous and all of this is falling apart is because you have trusted in the wrong thing. You have put your hope in the wrong place. So you've kind of settled in. This is going to settle my anxieties. My hope for the future is built on these things. And those are lies that your heart believed. You have put your hope in the wrong place and now you are Pain for it. See, um, James, if you took Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, starting in Matthew 5, and you laid it out right next to the book of James, James is almost an exposition of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, starting in verse 19, Jesus says this Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So there's two things happening in this text that both Jesus and James agree upon, which they're going to because they're both in the word of God. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, believes that Christ is the Messiah and his teachings are true. And, and so he, here's what we see. First of all, he, what, what Jesus' point is and what James's point is to some extent is that money and what we do with it and the measure at which we desire it reveal our heart more than our mouths and actions combined. And, and so here's what's happening. Here's what actually happens um, in our money and how we spend it and how we feel about it and how we think about it. You can say whatever you want to say with your mouth and you can live however you want to live with your life. But Jesus says you want to know what's going on in your heart, your heart, look at your bank statement. This is not a way for other people to judge, but rather for you to judge. See, your wallet is a gracious gift from God to help you understand what's actually going on in you. Other people cannot externally watch you and tell whether or not you're legitimately generous or not because they have no idea what you make. And so you might drive just a blinged out car and people think, oh gosh, he's just so earthly. And you might be one of the most generous brothers ever in a house that all the rest of our houses could fit in. We can't see that, but you can. Is it easier for you to believe that you're awesome and better than most people? Or is it easier for you to feel like you have a long way to go? See, the default posture of most of our hearts is nailing it. The default posture is, I, I hear you, Chandler, but I think I'm doing this well already. I, I get it. In fact, I wish my brother-in-law could be here. He just bought a new boat. He makes me sick. Right? I our default is our strength. I do this well. We justify our behavior well. So Jesus says, hey, just so you don't trick yourself, check your account. 
just so you don't deceive yourself, print out that bank statement and go through it line by line and let's see what you really treasure, what you really love, what your, where your heart is really set. So you can run your mouth about how you love the kingdom of God, how much you love Jesus, the difference he's made in your life, how much you're about what he's about. But Jesus says, yeah, I hear you. Why don't you, why don't you check that statement again real quick and let's chat. Again, this is not a way for others to judge us. This is a way for us to make sure we're not lying to ourselves. The, the second thing that, that's really toxic is, is not only uh, does our statement show us what we really value and what we really love, um, but we use our finances um, really in two separate ways, both of which are lies, both of which are extremely toxic. Um, the first is that we'll use uh, our wealth to kind of create safety and create kind of a, a shield to buffer us from life's anxiety. So a safer car, a nicer neighborhood, a safer house, uh, a house with like a, a, an alarm system and sharks and, and tigers and some bears out and they're like, we're gonna protect ourselves. We're gonna not walk in anxiety and fear. We're gonna be safe. And we use our money as a type of future hope that everything's gonna be all right in the future because I've saved well and I've prepared for that. Both are lies and both actually betray their toxic. They are the air that we're breathing. Let me give you a couple of texts um, that, that don't just reinforce but are birthed from Jesus and James' teachings on money. Soren Kierkegaard said this. He was a Danish philosopher. Riches and abundance come hypocritically clad in sheep's clothing, pretending to be security against anxieties, and they become then the object of anxiety. They secure a man against anxieties just about as well as the wolf that is put to tending the sheep. And then Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is my kind of pastor, Um, Bonhoeffer was a pastor uh, during World War II in Germany, saw that Hitler was a tyrant and got with another group of men and sought to kill Hitler. Um, The the plan was foiled, and um, he actually was martyred. Uh, But but I'll tell you this, trying to kill a tyrant and failing and getting killed for that is a much better way to go than in a hospital bed in your 90s. So hang me with some piano wires for trying to kill a tyrant. Uh, That's how Dietrich went out. That's why I like this dude. I would have liked to hang out with him, but... He got himself killed. So uh, with, with that said, here's his quote. Earthly goods deceive the human heart into believing that they give it security and freedom from worry. But in truth, they are what cause anxiety. Now, we know this is true. Watch this. How many of you, your first car was just a clunker, like a beat up, please God, let it start kind of clunker? <laughs> All right, how many of you? That was your first car. Okay, so my, my first car was a Datsun Maxima. How many of you have no idea what a Datsun is? All right, boom. See, that's how I know. So daddy got me a Datsun Maxima. It was pale yellow, and there was a little bit of rust in the front panel, so he primered it. All right, the fourth gear, you couldn't put it into fourth gear, so you had to jump from third to fifth, which if you drive a stick, which hardly anybody does anymore, is not easy. And then if you went too slow, the car would backfire. So anytime you went through a school zone, children would hit the ground and try to shimmy towards safety. So that's the car that I was gifted graciously by my parents. Let me talk straight about the car. Never noticed a nick on it. If it it ever got door ding, never saw it. If it got keyed, wouldn't know it. I never, in four years of driving it, parked it seven blocks out from the store and walked in just to make sure nobody would mess with my car. And then I got a new car. And I noticed every nick and every door ding and every, right? It created anxiety. It didn't take anxiety from me. It actually caused me anxiety that wasn't there before I had the new car. And then I was tempted to park a little farther out and I did get frustrated when people parked dumb. I'm just like, really? Those are lines, man. They're, they're just lines. Lauren's so sweet and gracious. She's like, well, maybe the person before them messed it up, Matt. It's like, this is not a time for that, all right? You, you, you save that for the children, woman, all right? And, and so, uh, I mean, now all of a sudden I've got this anxiety that was not there. It created an anxiety in us. Not a, not a kind of soul-crushing, what are we gonna do anxiety, just a, a little bit of concern, a little bit of thought that wasn't there before I had. See, um, Dietrich and Soren and Jesus and James are saying stuff creates anxiety. It doesn't solve it. So if you can buffer your fears with stuff, you 
you've just replaced your fear with another fear of your stuff that has buffered your fears being taken from you and leaving you now without those things with those same fears. It will not solve the anxieties of today. It won't do it. It'll just increase them. That's the argument. And then the second argument is that you can somehow save and plan and operate in such a way that your future is secure. Now, let, let's, I, we need to be real honest about this. On top of money being dangerous and our heart being deceptive, that, that a love of money, so, so that's different, a love of money is deadly, is deadly. And that's what we see happening here. If you start in verse four, look what happens. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, here's, here's my guess. My guess is that we're reading this, and you're like, oh, give me a break, Pastor. Are you trying to tell me I'm going to kill somebody over money? Now, let, let's chat for a second. Um, maybe, but maybe. Um, so, safe place, TP a non-aggression. How, how many of you love those kind of 2020 specials, those murder mystery things that come on? You're like, who did it? How many of you? Come on, let's do this. Safe place. Safe place. Okay, now let's chat. Isn't it always the spouse? <laughs> Isn't it like there's all this mystery? And you're like, man, you know that man killed his wife. I don't care if he's in Aruba. He probably got a submarine or something, came back, murdered that woman, got back in the submarine, went back to Aruba, cashed in that insurance policy. Like almost all crime is built upon money and a love of it and wanting more of it. And what's crazy is so often it's people with tons of it who want more of it that do this type of thing. Now, let me tell you why it goes on. I'll read a text to you here in a minute, but I wanna show you kind of the slippery slope uh, of sin and, and why we get ourselves into far greater messes than we ever imagined that we actually could. You and I are, by nature of being made in the image of God, eternal beings. We will live live forever, either in an ever-expanding experience of God's glory and grace or an ever-expanding experience of the right, just wrath of God for our glad rebellion against him. So we are eternal, so the temporary can never satisfy, which is why we're never ultimately satisfied. So we, we always want a little bit more, and we always feel like if we just get a little bit more, we'll finally be satisfied, and we get on that treadmill, and we spend most of our days chasing after what we already have, thinking a little bit more of it's gonna finally grant us peace. This is toxic. It doesn't work this way. And so um, in a book called The Twilight of the Elites by Christopher Hayes, um, he quotes this survey that Fidelity did. Fidelity surveyed a group with at least one million investment assets excluding real estate and retirement. So let's get our heads around this because this is not most of us. All right, so um, they have one million $1 million in um, investment assets that exclude their retirement and exclude any real estate that they have. So let's take their houses, maybe plural out, probably plural out. Let's take their retirement, their 403Bs, any kind of savings account that's meant to kind of buffer their retirement. Let's take all of that and throw it out. They've got a million dollars of investment assets, a million dollars that they're trying to turn into more money. So they've got a million dollars just to play with. And of those that Fidelity surveyed that fit that criteria, 42% of them did not feel wealthy. Million dollars. You wealthy? I'm not. Well, bro, you, you, you have a million dollars. I know, see? <laughs> no, what, what's happened? What's happened is that it, an eternal created being is trying to satisfy their hearts with temporary things, and the temporal will never fill up the eternal. It leaves us just thirsty and hungry for more. And so what 1 Timothy 6 is gonna tell us, what Paul is gonna write to Timothy is this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. Verse eight, if you just read it and see what happens to your heart. It's, if it sounds unreasonable to you, then, then we need to kind of dig around in our soul a little bit. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. What? You trying to tell me if I have some pants and a burrito, I'm gonna be all right? That's what he just said. I mean, in different words, but that's basically, if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. I'll be real honest, I don't think I could be content with just food and clothing. I feel owed more than that. I feel like I've worked too hard to just have that. Don't judge me right now, like you're over there going, really? That's disappointing. <laughs> but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, here's the disintegration of the heart, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So they have a desire to be rich. That's their, I desire to be rich, but we've already covered it. They'll never be able to feel rich regardless of what they have because they're eternal, trying to satisfy their hearts with the temporal. And so the desire desire to be rich with earthly gain and an inability to satisfy the heart with earthly gain begins to send one down a path that the Bible says is a snare that leads to senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Why? Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils, and it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. The love of money leads to death, spiritual death easily, but maybe even physical. See, um, the wealthy who, whose earnest desire is just to accumulate more wealth will be far more prone to oppress and to build systems that take advantage of the poor than those who are content. Hey, you need this. Hey, you gotta have this. Hey, your stuff's old. Hey, you're not cool. Hey, this would make you cool. Hey, this would make you more fulfilled. Hey, you earn this. You deserve this. You should have this. You're a fool if you think that 360 times a day you hearing that has no effect upon you. You are certainly unaware of the deception going on in your own heart. You're not just wearing the clothes you're wearing because you think they're comfortable. You're not just driving the car that you're driving. Listen, We've been discipled. We've been discipled by the world that we live in. They have defined for us what's attractive. They have defined for us what's manly. They have defined for us what's feminine. They have defined for us what the world should look like. And they have lied and they have created a toxicity that if we're not careful, we're breathing in. And it's only the gospel that can deliver us from such toxicity. How does the gospel deliver? Well, it delivers on two fronts, and both of them, I think, have to be there. Um, the, the first front is, is that um, God, the whole basis of the gospel is rooted in the generosity of God. So Romans 1 says this is something that all of us are guilty of. Everyone in this room has preferred creation to the creator. So forget you, God. I just want your stuff. So I just want your toys. I don't necessarily want you. So we're all guilty of that. God's response to that is generosity. He sends. He, Jesus, comes. He dies on the cross, absorbing God's wrath towards those of us who would believe, and then grants to us, imputes to us, the righteous obedience of Jesus Christ. The gospel in and of itself is the generosity of God flowing out of the Godhead. And it grants to us a new identity that serves as a buffer against the barrage of toxicity that our culture throws at us. So my primary identity is one of a son of God. I have been adopted by the blood of Christ according to the will of God. That's my identity. Everything else might fall away and that's still who I am. I'm not defined by my car. I'm not defined by my house. I'm not defined by my clothes. I'm not defined by what you think about me. You don't have that power over me. The gospel creates this buffer. I am his. I have been approved by the only one I need approval from. And as honestly as I can state that that's true, I still feel the pull. I still feel the pull. 
Like I, I do, I drive an old Honda Accord. It's beat up and banged up a little bit and I, I'll feel it. I can feel it pulling on me. The gospel provides a buffer. And then here's the second thing, and I think both of these pieces. My, my identity being in Christ says that you don't get to define me by my car, my house, or my clothes. So I'm free from the need to, to buy $70 t-shirts. Just free, I, I don't need that. I don't need that. The $7 ones fit just fine. And then the second thing, and this is the piece that I feel so missing the second thing is I'm invited out of the mundane and into the greatest drama the universe will ever know. See, um, God has decreed, God has informed that, that he's on a mission and we have been invited into that mission. See, we have not just been saved from, but we've been saved Two, we've been rescued from our sins, sealed with the Holy Spirit's promise and power, and sent out to push back what's dark in the world with victory being guaranteed by our King. So our gifts, our energy, and our resources have been given to us so that we might participate in the great war, pushing back what's dark in the world, watching boredom be eradicated from our lives. Gosh, I've said some version of this for 13 years now. There's a reason that we're drawn to superhero movies. There's something in all of our literature and all the films that we love that show that what we really desire and value at a deep level is self-sacrifice, risk, Unfortunately, I think these are ideas that we would ascribe to and say we value, but our wallets and lives would say we don't at all. Because we're not great at, most of us aren't great at history, and we haven't had a war like World War II in our lifetimes, we have forgotten what the country did in order to pull off that victory. There was rationing, there were victory gardens that were grown. Everyone gave and sacrificed for one purpose, to win this war and the rise of the autonomous self and the me 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 what about me and the earthly mindset of most of us have robbed from us the joy and thrill of being a part of something greater than ourselves so that we love the idea of self-sacrifice as long as we don't have to self-sacrifice love the idea of laying down our lives for something greater as long as it's Iron Man doing it, not me. See, it's, it's kind of a sad state of affairs. It reveals the toxicity that flows in our blood that we drink in 360 times a day. So what are we to do living in this spiritual highland that we're living in? Well, I think two things. Uh, the first is that I think we need to grow in financial wisdom. If we're, if we're honest, uh, most of us were not trained well by our parents how to handle money. In fact, um, the story on repeat here at the village as we walk with 30-year-olds is this. Um, we got to see our parents at their peak earning years, right? So we saw that our high school and into college, if we went to college days, we're watching our parents, not as they started out and worked towards, but really at the apex of how they earned and what they made. So we went off to college, and then when we got out of college, we think life should just look like this, and so we bit off way more than we could chew. We started living a life that we cannot afford. We jammed ourselves up. We with all sorts of debt that have created marital strife, created a ton of anxiety, and created really some spiritual handcuffs in what we're actually able to do. So if this is you, I'm not dogging you. I'm telling you, you got a lot of company here. We have men and women here that are here to help you with that. To come out from under the burden of all of that and begin to walk in the freedom that I think the Lord has for you. So not only do I think we need to grow in a financial understanding, financial wisdom, but we also have to pursue contentment. So um, here's the thing about contentment. You're gonna have to pursue it. At, at 360 reminders a day of what you don't have and what you should have, you're gonna have to fight for contentment. So how, how, do you, how do you pursue contentment? Well, you become acquainted with all that you do have rather than spending all of your time wishing that you could get something else. So you dial into the good gifts. So I'll, I'll love you enough to say, you don't have anything that wasn't given to you. You don't have anything that wasn't given to you. You own nothing that is not 
in some way related to God's graciousness towards you. And you might be a great businessman, and I can introduce you to other great businessmen who the ball hadn't bounced their way. You might be a hard, hard worker, and I'll introduce you to dozens of hard, hard workers who the, the ball has not bounced their way like it has for you. You have been blessed, and all that you have belongs to the Lord. You want to grow in contentment? Cultivate gratitude. Cultivate gratitude for what you have been given. And, and then lastly, be generous. Let me tell you a couple of kind of best practices that I think work real well and they kind of tie these things together. Um, the first thing is I think you should have a budget and, and one of the fun ways that Laura and I have learned to be content and try to be generous is we have a line item every month that, that's just, it's called generosity. And, and back in the day, I'm gonna be straight with you, back in the day it was like $18 in it. Like when we first got married, generally, we tried to pay off student loans, had some credit card debt. Had, so we, I mean, we had like 18 bucks in there. But here's what was so fun. We would try, I mean, that puts our head, I mean, we've got $18 to give away this month. Who are we giving it to? Who are we blessing? How are we, and back, you know, 18 bucks, what are you gonna do? Buy a guy a cup of coffee? And then, you know, you still need another dollar or two, right? And, and so, um, man, we had 18 bucks. And then as our income has grown, the percentage in that line item has also grown. So now, Lauren and I have the opportunity. She walks with a ton of single women and, and single mothers. And she'll have, on our little Sunday night meeting, she'll say, hey, there, there's this woman. Here's what's happened. Do you think we can take some of that generosity money this month and give it to them? And I'm like, that's great. I also saw one of our um, young interns, man. They're tired. I saw their car today, man. It looked like the dude's riding the Indy 500. They're gonna get killed in this weather, let's see if we can get them some tires. And, and what ends up happening is now we're growing in contentment, growing in generosity, simply because we have a line budget item that says we're giving this much away this month. And it becomes a real fun game for Lauren and I. And it blesses us to secretly do things and give away and to touch things. And then... Another practical thing on generosity is, is one, uh, I want to have a line item in my budget where I'm giving away money. And man, if, if you're like, gosh, this is so, man, if it's $4, that's $4. You got to start somewhere. You're like, well, Dave Ramsey said $1,000 in savings and pay off. Hey, praise God for Ramsey. I'm glad you're reading him. That at least is showing some effort. I agree with about 95%, but I think even if you can take two or three bucks and start with being generous, that that's gonna produce a kind of fruit that you want in your lives, a type of gladness that you want in your lives. And then finally, finally, when Lauren and I give, we wanna give in such a way that we get the biggest bang for our buck and find ourselves on the tip of the spear of what God's doing globally. So here's how we'll spend chunks of money as it comes in. We wanna see God reached unreached people groups around the world, and we wanna see churches planted. Why? Regardless of what your zeal is and passion is in life, maybe you wanna see the sex trade um, shut down, maybe you wanna see kids educated and fed, maybe you, it gets solved when there's a gospel preaching, Jesus loving church planted in a community that understands the missional call of God on their lives, and this is what you've been called to. Oh, that we might be an open-handed, generous group of men and women inflamed with a zeal for the gospel. This is the great drama you've been called into. Or you could just keep collecting the stuff of future garage sales. That's a good option. But, but I want to sacrifice. And I want to risk my life. I want to see the kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven.